YouTube, it's Craig here and I'm back with a new video. In this one, we're gonna be talking about grail pens and what else is new in the Waterman collection. So let's get right into it. Hey you guys, I wanna start off by talking about some things I made for the California Pen Show. I am gonna be bringing postcards. So they're fountain pen friendly paper. This image is from both sides of Broadway from Bowling Green to Central Park, 1910. This is now a public domain image, so I'm able to use it. But here is 173 Broadway. I mean, it's just that building. It's not a very big building and they never made any pens there, but this was their headquarters from 1902 to 1917. They stamp here, domestic one cent, four and two cents. Correspondence address. There's a little bit of branding right there in the middle. Made in America by Craig Rockanova and Co. 173 Broadway. And this is the second one. And this is the interior of 191 Broadway, the new pen corner from 1917, I believe until the 1930s. And I have this original glass negative. I won it off of eBay last year. Here is that glass negative. I'm not gonna really be able to show you too much of it, but here it is all wrapped up. And I took it to a photo place where they were kind enough to do a one digital scan of the negative. But here is the interior of 191 Broadway. This is from Architecture and Building, 1917. And you got all the ink bottles and everything down there. This oak case was big enough to carry up to 30,000 pens. There's the back side of this one, same thing. Place stamp here, a little bit of brand in the middle. New pen corner, 191 Broadway, New York. These are the postcards that I'm gonna have at the California Pen Show. Sell or, I don't know, I'll figure out what to do with them, but I have about 200 of each. The topic for today is grail pens. And what is a grail pen to you? Grail pens to me has changed over the years. My first ever grail pen that I really, really wanted was the Lamy 2000. And in 2016, I had finally gotten my Lamy 2000. I haven't inked it up in a long time. Haven't used it in a long time. I, I just have other interests at the moment, but this was still my grail pen for this thing. And I had wanted it so much. And I just, that was so out of my realm, what I thought was affordable at the time, but great pen. It's something I'll always keep in my collection. I'll never get rid of this thing. And from time to time I use it, but probably in the last year I haven't inked it up once, but super easy to maintain, take care of. Grail's anything you really obsess over and you know, you save up the money and you acquire it. My idea of a grail is very different now than just saving up the money and getting the piece. A lot of these antique watermans that I have, you can't just save up and buy it. You know, you just can't go out of your way and pick up a pen. My second grail was the Chink and Dragon, the Miki Emperor. This was one of those things where, hey, if I can save up the money, I'll get it. And that's exactly what I did. I was able to save up some money. And by some money, I mean a lot of money. And I was able to get this pen. And it's eventually going to my partner. And by eventually, I mean it is. This is his pen. I've already given it to him and uh, it's nice of him to let me hold on to it, at least for now for him. If you have the money and you know, they have them online, you're able to just buy it. My biggest grail pens are actually the smallest of pens. I made a whole video on this one already, but this is a Waterman's checkbook pen. So they have a little flared bit so that you could slot it into a pen holder on a checkbook. And they didn't sell all that well just because $2.50 for a little tiny pen that didn't hold that much ink that had like one purpose. It just wasn't a real top seller. And they're very expensive um, now. I mean, this was $2.50 and now they go for $1,500. They're, they're just so rare and hard to come by. But this is from about 1908. Has these little patent dates on the barrel there. This came from the collection of Gary Lair, who passed away a couple years ago, and I bought it through Fountain Pen Hospital. Here it is compared to a Kaveco Sport. It is very, very small. Then the next one I picked up was this one, which is also from around the same time, 1908 or so. And this is a Cardinal Red hard rubber. It's for those of you that don't know Waterman's or, you know, Parker or anything like that. Uh, this is Cardinal Red, even though it is orange. It is still cardinal red. And what's special about this one is it says the National Association of Stationers and Manufacturers, Hotel Somerset, Boston, July 1908. And this one has its accompanying little, this is where this used to slot into. It doesn't fit anymore. But this is the matching little notebook that goes with this pen. Trussell Manufacturer Company and the L.E. Waterman Co. So at this, 
and the paper to go along with it. And what's interesting too is it says manufacturers and stationers, but on here they printed it stationers and manufacturers S and M. Here was M and S. Still pretty cool. It's got some info in there. I don't know if that's someone's social security number, but it's in there. This is very old. And then the very, very back, you have the loose leaf pocket memo set. Super cool, really rare to find. So this was another super grail for my collection. And the last one of the checkbook pens I have is this one. This is a Sterling checkbook pen. It's an early one, around probably around 1905. It's not cataloged or anything like that. So this is just a very early version of the more common ones that, that are around. But I, I got offered by a dealer. One of the guys I talked to on Facebook offered me one for, I think it was 2,800. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll take it, I'll do it. Because, oh, you know what, I offered it to someone else. So if he says that he doesn't want it, it's yours. And a couple days later he came back and he said, hey, the other guy bought it, so I'm sorry about that. And I said, okay, that's fine, I'll look for another one. And then I bought one from a dealer after the Columbus Pen Show, I paid 2,000 for it. And unfortunately it got stolen out of the mail. It never made it off the UPS truck. The, someone from UPS saw whatever box that it was in, thought it was something else and Unfortunately, that package wasn't insured, so I lost that pen. The dealer has since made it up to me, but this pen came from my friend Otto in a trade. I traded a 404 Gauffaresque and $300, and I got this pen. So about $1,800 into this pen. Beautiful little checkbook pen, really early one. I don't think I'll ever find another one that looks just like this one. This is the much more common Sterling Filigree version. This is a much earlier one. And there you go, that was my grail. And after I bought this pen, after I acquired this pen, I really lost interest. And I, I was like, okay, I got my grail. I, I don't know what to do. And then I started getting into other things and my watches again. That's how I got back into modern pens was just like, I, I'm done, I found what I wanted. And now luckily I have other grails that I wanna go for. One of the grails that I'm always looking for is anything that was possibly owned by Lewis Edson Waterman. The closest I've come is this book, Lives of the Hunted. This book retails for like 25 bucks on eBay. This is a first edition of the book. I haven't read the book yet. It literally just came in yesterday from eBay. But the reason why I bought it was because of this, this is the nameplate of Lewis Edson Waterman. So this book, I don't think it was owned by him only because the book was published after he had already died, but this is definitely from his collection. And that is the stamp of his son, Lewis Edson Waterman Jr., who was um, a vice president of the Waterman Company. That's dated 2202. I can guarantee that that number 636 was written with a Waterman pen same up here but i have a book with the founder's nameplate in it with the founder's son's name in it and yeah that's super cool it's not a pen but these are the kind of things that i go crazy for there's another grail i want to get the baby pen if it actually exists i don't know if anyone out there has seen it but it is basically the same thing as this just without the flared cap and I mean, uh, a, a pen for children, that, that didn't last long. So uh, that is another thing I really wanna get. As far as my grails go, I would say um, an Indian scroll would be cool. Cable chased, definitely want a cable chased. Everyone's telling me I need to go after these heavy flower, rose wreath, lace, you know, just try and get one of those super rare pens. But they're so expensive, they're so rare. They're so hard to come by. But I want a hexagon pen. Never seen one before in person but I'd love to get a hexagon pen, just even a black hard rubber hexagon. And I don't have a photo of it here, but this one, the hexagon twist. That, super early, but it looked really cool. Hexagon twist, that is another rail that I would absolutely love for my collection. Here are some more of my latest additions to the collection. Here we have a Waterman 20 POC. POC stands for pocket. Um, it is a screw cap eyedropper. It's a big pen, very, very, very big pen. And here it is next to the Chink and Dragon Emperor. Pretty comparable in size. This is from around 1914, 1915. This is raised threads, 
giant eyedropper filled pen. This one probably had a crack in the cap at some point and they replaced it with this 14 karat gold band that is on there. But they did a really good job. You can only kind of tell that it's been replaced by looking inside the cap, but outside of that, it, it looks great. Works great, nice, nice earlier imprint on there. And on the bottom, 20 POC and that giant, giant, crazy, giant, huge, massive, crazy, giant, number 10 size nib. I think it's just massive, the giant spoon feed. You can even see the, the imprint on there for the patent date. This one has a fine semi-flex nib. Just a beast. You don't need to post it, but you can post it. So I got that from my friend Nick Pang. This is an early Chase Filigree gold filled pen around 1905 to 1908. And this is an 0514. As an engraving, this says HML from 214 NALC. Don't know what that is, but it's on there. It has an early patent date on the cap. And yeah, got this one from David Nishimura, vintagepens.com along with this early fine silver, the engraving of AO on there. This one just says 12 on the back and it's light, lightly oxidized and they actually replaced the feed. So the feed is actually a spoon feed versus what it should have probably had, which is um, the three Fisher feed, but it has a nice early star nib. So the nib itself is from 1896. These are also from David Nishimura. These are dummy pens. So actually a couple weeks ago sold a dummy set on eBay, but then when I was sick with food poisoning after I bought those, David Nishimura was nice enough to send me these, which is, you know, they're cool. And they were meant to be on display and not worry about the pens being destroyed by the sun or, or whatever. So they have no nibs in them. You can see the holes in the back of the caps. They're all glued together. Well, this one, the lever actually does work, which is kind of funny. This one's glued down. They have the price tags on them, 275 with the clip. These are supposed to be number 52s, but what's kind of funny is uh, the barrels themselves are marked 54, but who cares? They were just dummy pens. They were meant, they were just meant for displays. The last one I have here is a modeled hard rubber 12S safety pen. And the modeled pens are a little bit more hard to come by, especially in their earlier models here. Um, this one is inked up. I have been using it a lot. I've got some red ink in there right now, but it has the threaded knob on the bottom. So the pen really swirls out. And these are really rare, especially early models like this, with the that threaded knob at the bottom. So this is from 1908 and that cap, I don't know if it's the original cap to go to this pen, but it looks really cool, especially with how deep and dark that modeling is. And I bought this from my buddy, Tim Wynn. Those are some of the newer models. I've actually had this one for like a couple months now. Been using it a lot. This one technically isn't mine, so I'm gonna take that one out. But I think my two OG grails are pretty special. This is one that I, don't, I can't ever get rid of. It's the pen that I've had the longest in my collection. And this is one I'll, I'll never get rid of. I went through so much heartbreak to try and get this one pen. And um, it's really special to know that there are collectors out there that have been collecting it for as long as I've been alive and they don't have this pen. So that is really crazy and super cool. But keep collecting guys, whether it's a Jinhao, whether it's a Pilot, whether it's a Lamy Safari, keep on collecting fountain pens. And that's the video. Thanks so much for checking out, you guys. If you have any questions, go and leave a comment down below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe for more content like this. And thank you guys so much. I hit 3,000 subscribers here on the channel. It's been a crazy couple of years here. I remember when I first hit 50, and I thought that was crazy. And here we are at 3,000 subscribers. So thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. I have more giveaways coming, so thank you to all who joined in from the Nakaya giveaway. It's been uh, just a great year for the channel, and I know I've had a lot of ups and downs. The focus is still going to be on Waterman's with the occasional modern pen video here and there or the occasional wristwatch video. I have so many more things to share with you guys, and I feel like 2024 is going to be the best year yet. Check out my Instagram, at Kreekrakanova. And of course, my pen collection Instagram is at 173 Broadway, and I'll see you guys all in the next video. All right, peace.
Thank you.